Would you please stand for our gospel reading this morning? Our sermon text comes from Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. If you'd like to follow along in the Pew Bible, that begins on the second page of the Newer Testament. Matthew 2, 1. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and we have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. <clears throat> and when you have found him, bring me word, so that, you, that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. And then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the good news of our Lord Jesus, Messiah. Let the church hear what the Spirit say. Let us pray. Gracious God, speak to us in these moments. Touch our hearts with your light and life and hope. Come, be among us. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen.
wrote this sermon about kings and strangers coming to, to worship the newborn child and looking for the presence of God being made manifest in our midst. I think that the, the events of this week kind of override that for me. I don't know about you, so I'm winning it. You may or may not want to record this day. <laughs> Heaven only knows where it's going. <laughs> I sure don't. I think that a lot of us thought that it was possible that Bill might not last long after Mary died. 62 years is a long time to spend with a person, a partner in life in every way. that I could never have imagined that it would be this way. I could never have imagined that a fall down a flight of stairs would precipitate Bill's passing. And the tragedy of that, I had a, an email, email this week from a friend who asked the circumstances, what had happened, and I, I told her what had happened. And I said, honestly, it just breaks my heart. And it does. It just breaks my heart. These are people. Isabel, Mary, Bill, Kenny, Carl, Alvin. People who had given their lives to the service of God through University Baptist Church. They weren't all the same kind of people and they didn't have all the same kinds of gifts and they didn't offer the same kinds of service, but what they had, they gave. And to me, that's, that's the legacy that we have to carry. That's, that's, that's what mo motivates us to move ahead. You don't replace these people. There's, there's no sense in which you replace them. They are, as each of us is, irreplaceable. But they are for us exemplars. They are for us epitomes, if you will, of, of how to live lives of service. And these are, these are smart people. You know, the world looks at, at the churches and sees division and infighting and, pardon me, nutcases on every side. I mean, come on. These guys predicting the return of Christ last May. Well, huh. What are you going to do with that? But what the world can't see, what the world doesn't understand, People who are outside the churches or, or in some way inherently critical of the churches don't see is that there is a reality that goes beyond science. And there's a reality that goes beyond the physical manifestations of the world that are all around us. There is a spiritual reality in each person. Whether or not we want to admit it or whether or not we want to recognize it is immaterial. It's there. And we express that reality in the way we live our lives. And as I look back at this, this past year, I see so much experience, so much wisdom, so much stubbornness. <laughs> That stubbornness for for all the frustration it may have offered, and, and it did. I mean, let's admit it. It did. It, it brought a lot of frustration to us, but it also brought a kind of commitment that is foreign to so much of the world today. I'm speaking not long ago with a pastor who considered it a wonderful thing if the church leaders in, in his congregation came twice a month to worship 
That's about all he thought he could expect. We're all so busy. We all have so many other things that we want to be doing. That worship, well, you know, just kind of gets bumped down the list. And yet, for Isabel and Bill and Mary, come what may, the doors were open. They were here. They were here to serve and to give of themselves. Other stuff didn't take precedence. Which is not to say that their, their lives were sort of monochrome. That this was all that there was. Bill was a world-renowned educator. And people looked to him with respect and honor because of what he knew and, and because of who he was. And Mary, who would... We were talking to some of us after, after the memorial service about how Mary would have just been so frustrated with all the fuss we were making over her. And would never have thought about her life in terms of the numbers of people that she had an impact on. And yet literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people on every continent, save Antarctica, knew her and had their lives touched by her. These, these people, these, these wonderful saints of God lived their lives outside the walls of this building and yet firmly rooted in this building and other buildings and at this table. They did what they did in part because of their commitment to this community, this faith community, this, this family. Their faith, their belief, their commitment was unwavering. And it motivated them to do great things for the vision of God. I, I just, I, I'm so in awe of these people and their commitment. I, I, for some reason, it's been in my mind after I heard about Bill. There was a, a council of ministries meeting not long after I got here. And, and Bill <coughs> was talking about some concerns that he had in, in terms of the support ministry of the church, the, the, the facilities, and so on. And afterwards, he came up to me and he almost had tears in his eyes. He looked so sad. And he said, I don't mean to be so negative. And I thought then, and I have thought many times since, he isn't negative. He wasn't negative. He was realistic. He was honest. And he kept, kept us, kept me honest to the physical realities of this ministry. That was a gift he had. And people might have thought he was negative. They did, I don't think they understood his concern for what we did and for our physical presence in the community was so great that he would say things that we might not always have wanted to hear. His commitment to the choir, his commitment to ministry in this church. We found a photograph of Michael cleaned out the archives room in the student house. And there was a photograph of a group of people signing a contract, I think, for the building of the building originally in the 60s. And there, front and center, 
was Bill <coughs> signing the contract on behalf of University Baptist Church. Firmly rooted in this world, and yet firmly rooted also in a world beyond measure. That's a legacy for all of us. It's probably what's the word dangerous, I guess, for me to say this, but I don't know. It, my sense is that all of us have stories about Bill and Mary and Isabel and Kenny and Carl and Alvin that we can share, and I hope we do. Share them promiscuously. Share them widely and freely. And I would encourage you to follow the example of those stories. To live lives of commitment. To live lives of service. Not for some reward that may be out there in the world or may be out there beyond the world. But because that's who, who we are. That's what Christianity means. It means giving of ourselves constantly, consistently, not for reward, but because of an impulse, an impetus, a commitment, a stubbornness to do the best and be the best that we can be, whatever it is that we're doing. Share your stories often. Repeat them often. It's in the stories of our lives that we see the work of God revealed. I guess that's about all I have to say about that. It is a heavy day, but at the same time, this is still the Christmas season on our liturgical calendar. And as Paul said, we do not grieve as those who have no hope. We grieve, and I, I told you before, I'm broken hearted, but not without hope. The hope of this season, the life and the light that we remember about Jesus coming into the world is so, so much a part of who these people were. Kenny, Carl, and Alvin, Isabel, Mary, and Bill. We do them dishonor, I believe, if we grieve without hope. We will grieve. We are grieving. And we'll grieve for a long time. That's the way life is. But not without hope. I have a sermon text that I've used repeatedly for funerals. I won't use it soon. <laughs> uh, but it, it was it was with Jesus uh, after his death, he was buried in the tomb. And Pilate places a guard on the tomb. Because he's concerned that the, the disciples will break in and steal the body and start making wild and, and uh, unsubstantiated claims about it. And when, when the, the power comes and the life comes and the light comes, it isn't from outside the tomb, it breaks out from the inside. And I use that as a way to say that death is not the end. For those of us who uh, are, are living our lives in relationship to Christ, the end is life. The end is always life. So we don't grieve as those who have no hope. We grieve with joy, with solemnity, with sobriety, and grieve with hope. Let us pray.
God of all life, giver of light and love and joy and hope. We ask that you be with us in these days in which we feel so deeply these losses. Especially be with Jonathan and Olivia, David and Megan, Noreen and Tom, Kate, Beverly and Ian, and all of the family. Comfort them. Give them your presence. Fill them with your hope. Be with us always, we pray. In the name of the one who is our hope. Jesus, Messiah, our Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm.